right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you to this breakout session. Um, I thank you for being here. Um, I was told that there's a uh, Secretary of Education speaking at this hour, and I didn't know if we're going to end up with an inflow or an outflow. So um, <laughs> welcome, welcome to this. My name is Gordon Jones. Uh, I'm the Dean of the College of Innovation at Boise State University. And I'm thrilled to be here with this session of panelists discussing the title is Combating the Robots, the Role of Creativity and Entrepreneurship, Design Thinking in the Future of Learning and Work. Um, we have a neat and really um, top-notch panel here that I'm sure if you're like me, I'm excited to hear from on this topic. What I'd love to do is uh, lead off with just a little bit of an intro, as many of you have seen this uh, topic. And then we'll hear from our panelists from an intro standpoint, and then we'll jump into questions. If you did look at the description for this breakout, um, we talk about the shortage of tech skills is acute, but the need for creativity and entrepreneurship to drive the future of work, maybe even more so. Certainly in my vantage point, sitting in one learning institution, being that of a higher ed institution, I think there's a narrative that has pushed much of our institutions to drive the development of hard skills or the quote unquote robots, and uh, believing that links to uh, graduates and, and jobs. And yet, at the same time, um, I ask the question, do we, does that also leave us with a deficit in those skills of, uh, perhaps we call them softer skills, creativity, problem solving, a number of different ways in which you may describe, is, is that a tension we need to be worried about? Is it a tension at all? And with this panel today, I want to unpackage that and also learn a little bit about how the kinds of work that the panelists represent could be a pathway for um, this, uh, this either other shadow or complementary side being the robots. So with that, I'd love to ask panelists, I will say we have, um, we have uh, Guillermo Miranda, a chief learning officer at IBM with us today. We have Suzanne Howard, the Dean of IDEO University, coming out of IDEO Design Firm. Chase Jarvis, the CEO of Creative Live and out of Seattle. And we have Erica Kamen, the Chief of Staff from, um, from Masterclass with us here, both New York and, and San Francisco based. So with that, I'd love for intros, and why don't we start you, Erica? Sure, hi everybody, I'm Erica Kamen. Um, as Gordon said, I'm with Masterclass. Um, we're on a mission to help connect the world with genius. Um, so we create online classes by people that are the very best at their craft, um, enabling anyone in the world to learn directly from them. Um, so examples of our classes include uh, a tennis class taught by Serena Williams, acting taught by Dustin Hoffman or Kevin Spacey, um, screenwriting taught by Aaron Sorkin. So we're really passionate and have honed in a little bit on the, on the creative and the arts um, to start, um, but are excited to expand it um, and enable the world to learn from people that are really, really great at what they do and to help leave a legacy um, of, of lessons and learning uh, for, for generations to come. I'm Chase Jarvis. I'm the founder and CEO of Creative Live, which is the world's largest live streaming education company focused specifically on creativity and entrepreneurship. Uh, we've got 10 million students, more than 3 billion minutes of uh, video education consumed on our platform. Um, we also connect the world with the world's top experts, Pulitzer Prize winners, New York Times bestsellers. Um, we've had more than 1,500 classes produced, and we feel like we're just getting started. Uh, the creativity is the new literacy, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm excited to sit down with these esteemed colleagues up here on the stage. Suzanne? So hello everyone, I'm Suzanne Gibbs Howard. I'm the founder and dean of IDEO U, so that's IDEO's online learning platform where we teach a lot about design thinking, foundational skills in design thinking, but also more advanced skills in creative problem solving and creative leadership. And so we've started off about two years ago. IDEO has been around as an innovation consultancy for 30 years. And then we just experienced this incredible hunger to learn more from all around the globe at all the different techniques for wrestling with ambiguity and all of the challenges that we don't know how to solve out in the workforce and in universities today. So as of um, just last course run, we broke 15,000 learners and we are just serving them in all different ways that we're excited to share and talk with this group and many more. 
Uh, good, Guillermo Miranda, as you can see from my accent, I am not from Boston, I am Peruvian, <laughs> and I've been with IBM a little bit more than 18 years, I took a break, I came back, and in IBM, basically, we power many of the things that you do. So nine out of 10 transactions on a credit card, buying a ticket, making a reservation, anything is powered by IBM behind. Uh, and we are also doing something very interesting. We are powering the brain of the robots. So we are here to talk about that. Well, I, great. I mean, I think I, I'd like to jump right in, even off this topic, and, and who'd want to take it. Um, how much of a real or false dichotomy is it when we talk about combating robots, the role of creativity, um, design thinking, entrepreneurship, set, a, set in our title as sort of the counterbalance? Um, how do you all feel about that? Is that, is that true in your, in your way of thinking? You've all representing sort of a creative class or a preparation class where creativity is required. How do you think about that? Who'd want to take it? I think that the title of the panel might have been uh, a flop, given the attendance. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I know we're competing with another, uh, another um, uh, session down the road. But to, to tackle your question specifically, I, I think that they, it can't not coexist. It's, it's fake. It's fiction to think that it's just one or the other. Um, the question that I would ask back is, um, what is machine or what are machines without creativity? Honestly, creativity is what created the machines. So in the order of uh, hierarchy of thinking, I think we can't actually, we can't dismiss creativity as something that's secondary when it, in fact, is the thing that created the thing that is the other thing. How, how do you, how do you? How, see if you can crack that. I, I think I followed it, and maybe others did too. But uh, let me just run a little further on that. Do you, do you, and maybe none of you represent this category, but have you either seen or had a perception that schooling has created a trade-off between these and investment, every kid getting their computer lab, but not necessarily doing drama class or? I think there's thing? definitely, in the educational world, we're seeing certainly a swing toward different poles, and so you get a lot of people in K-12 education trying to go for, for um, STEM classes, and we certainly do not ever want to get in the way of that, but as we start to think about ways that we can complement the robots, make them more humane, um, collaborate with robots and start to bring about a world where we have this greater sense of balance between the extremes um, and bring about a respect for both. So I think we're working with lots of uh, uh, educational institutions and entrepreneurial programs and also engineering programs where they are bringing about a little bit more creativity just as we're seeing in arts programs, people needing to pick up coding as well. Yeah, let me, let me give you the example of IBM. In IBM we have 400,000 people that traditionally have been very focused on hardcore technology. So we do complex things, that, that's what we do. We send the people to the moon and come back, we run <laughs> the, the interchange of all the banking industry here, etc. But with the world of the cloud and with the cognitive layer artificial intelligence, all these things that the technology is allowing us to do as a company to shift towards this high value, we invested early on two things that are very important. One is design thinking. So anybody in IBM that touch any offering that goes to the market has to have a training certification, if you want, on design thinking. Start with the journey, what we want the client to touch and not what is the product or the technical specifications that is your initial instinct if you are training an engineering institute or something. And the second thing that we did is we changed dramatically all of our processes into an agile environment, environment. instead of the classical program management, uh, drop found time, et cetera. So when you think how to transform at the scale, you need to have those components of creativity and a space to go beyond what the machine can help you to do. We have extremely smart machines, very fast machines, but there is a component of curiosity, ingenuity that comes in the human brain that so far we have not replicated, and I don't think will be easy to replicate. 
And that's the way that becomes complementary. Do you feel like, I, I recall at one point hearing a story, and I don't know if it was David Kelly perhaps, out of Stanford and IDEO's founder, talking about the difference between technologists and designers. And I, I see that as almost a proxy for that, tech, that, that hard skill and the soft skill, and describing the, the, the creation of the mouse at Apple yeah. and <coughs> how engineers can, engineers can design and develop and tell you all about how to get it connected, how the, how the, uh, the click can work, but really designers are who tells you whether you should double click or not. An engineer, a hard yeah. skill. Suzanne, I don't know, maybe this is for you, but could you illustrate how that um, illustrates either this complementariness that Guillermo was talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking so much about, it's, a, it's about how you define creativity. And so there are certainly such a wide array of options in there. It's everything from photography to dance to <coughs> acting, but it's also creative problem solving, which is needed more than ever in our schools and in our workforce and the things that we're teaching our students. I think the way that we think about design thinking and the skills that we're trying to teach in those mindsets is that we don't even know what problems are going to face us in the near future. And some of that is um, uncontrollable and we need to have techniques and problem solving approaches that can, can deal with that kind of ambiguity and tackle the things the world doesn't even know are coming. And so I think as creatives, we approach it from emotion, from the softer skills, from the human standpoint, and then move through to the technological answers and the feasibility and the viability questions from there. And so all of these approaches are great and can work in partnership with each other, but we're out of balance if we don't have a bit of both. I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, maybe starting with you, Erica, what, what's driving the, the growth or the demand for a masterclass, a Creative Live, or an IDOU? Who are you serving? Talk a little bit about who's interested in increasing that creative capacity and talk about that. Yeah, it's really interesting. So um, our business is direct to consumer. Um, so anyone can take any of our classes. Um, and as I said, most of them to date have been kind of focused on the arts um, with a couple in, in sports. Um, what we've seen to date is um, a, a heavy a couple trends. Um, so in our business, um, we see practitioners that are studying a specific craft um, that may never have had the opportunity to interact directly with someone that's at the very peak of or pinnacle of their craft. So if it's Dustin Hoffman and I'm an aspiring actor, um, how can I hear directly from him um, the challenges that he went through um, when he was at my stage of, of acting and development. So practitioners are a big part of it for us. Um, there's also just an overall trend, I think, it, that, that's, that we've seen in our business that um, complements the topic of the panel nicely and that hard skills are, are great and while job, you know, jobs are growing in engineering and, um, and in business, um, there's also a little bit of a return, a people's desire to return to their personal passions um, from, in many cases, their youth. So uh, what we see, for example, when we launched James Patterson's writing class, um, we launched Jim's class and we were seeing not only as aspiring writers, but we were literally getting calls from like 80 year old women that were like, you know what? I haven't written in 40 years and I'm ready to start again. And I can't wait to hear how, and, and they're inspired by Jim's lessons um, and, 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 and by the creativity that he exhibits in his class. So um, it's, it's kind of a mix of people that are, you know, in a creative field that just want to further themselves and people that want to return and find something in themselves that maybe they lost um, due to a focus on a different career or um, just the craziness of life. It's truly a wide spectrum. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd love to just examine even the nature of the question for a second, like who are our customers? Um, if, you, if you petition a, a class full of six-year-olds and you say, who would like to come up and draw a picture on the board? 100% of the hands in the room go up. Yeah. Uh, and if you ask that same question at 10 or 12, 50% less, ask that same question at 18. So it's not a question of are we creative and is this new thing coming from somewhere? It's a thing that's systematically been trained out of us since birth. So I like the notion uh, of return. And you know, if, if you ask the question um, as you did, like who are our customers, it's really, it's, it's everyone. There's creativity inside of every person. The fact that Guillermo's talking about cre you know, creating robots, 
Um, that what to me is fr most frustrating is that it's a false dichotomy. It really isn't a this or a that. And when I hear a STEAM versus a STEM, I mean, you know, aren't we all in it together? And isn't that something that's innate in, in, in every single person? So to, to sort of manufacture the distinction is really that it's manufacturing. And what, what Creative Live stands for is unlocking that creative potential that's inside of every person. And the, the, science, the science, excuse me, is unambiguous that creativity creates creativity. So whether you're talking about creativity with a small c, photography, design, whatever, or creativity with a capital C, which to be crystal clear, the, the, the problem to every solution that our planet will ever know will only be solved through creativity. The water crisis, the hunger crisis, any epidemic, all of these problems require creativity at their foundation. So you can pretend that it doesn't exist until it comes to bite you in the ass. And what you realize when you look at the data, the data says that small c creativity, creating something every day, taking photos, writing, uh, designing, um, seeing through the eyes of other empathy, these are the things that create creativity with a capital C. Musician, or, or brain surgeons who are musicians are better brain surgeons. The reading and writing that you do at night, it will make you be a better scientist. So, you know, I think when you ask who the customer is, the customer is, you know, six and a half billion people. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I don't want to, like, hyperbole is dangerous, but it's, I think, equally or more dangerous to believe that there isn't or there aren't creative elements inside of every single person. It's so interesting hearing where you guys go with it. I mean, I think for us, when we started out, our early adopters at IDOU were certainly people who'd been in touch with the work that IDEO does, which is out in the world with design and lots of technologies and everything from schools that we were sharing in Peru earlier today. And so we had people coming who were wanting more of that in their lives. They were already the early adopters. They were the people who were doing some of this and maybe some of the small C creativity. But I think the folks that I've gotten the most excited about are when we move into larger corporations, um, large automotive organizations, enormous technology organizations that are spread around the globe. And what I feel like we're starting to see is that we are teaching like the social and emotional learning for the workforce. You know, we're kind of teaching people that it's okay to admit that you don't know the answer to things and that's what we're gonna figure out together and that you're not afraid to fail. These things are so hard to do in the modern workforce and none of us are well set up for them. And so we need supports around us, which the creative world provides mm -hmm. to support this coming into work. And so when I hear people in an enormous global manufacturing organization of, of medical devices say that all they learned to do was admit that they had failed at something, but they had learned something great out of it, that's one of the biggest mindset shifts mm. I think we can ask for to bring from the world of creativity into the world of education and into the world of work. Let me, let me ask a question. I mean, Chase, I think that's a really interesting statistic or um, observation about every six-year-old, half the 12-year-olds, and only a smattering of 21-year-olds. Do any of you have a perspective on, is that, is that benign neglect by some collection or individual um, entities or, is it something you think is more nefarious that you would no. call out? I mean, how would you kind of, what, what, what advice would you kind of have for folks working with those pre-18 year olds who then can sign up for the master class, or I'm sure they could sign up younger, but talk about that. Sure, um, well you don't get a world with diversity, inclusion, innovation, um, design thinking, all of these things that create the best, uh, most rich experiences in the world with a system that doesn't have the, a similar level of innovation. So what we're relying on and where this, this past comes from is from a system that was uh, an educational system that was based largely on two things. The factory, which is a Prussian model from the 1800s, it says you put raw material in one end, you move it through the system at the same rate, regardless of, you know, it's just, you gotta attach the widget, attach the widget, and then at the other end, you've created a good little widget or a soldier or this is, this is the kind of thing that we're, that historically we have done to our children, to our own population. That's the mechanism. And the reason schools have summer off is to uh, work in the fields, literally. So we, we've got a system that has historically been based on things that were totally out of whack with where the world is going and, and needs to go. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's more exciting than ever before 
A, to be alive in this world, to um, be in education, but I also feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to move the world, and that's why you know, I, I enjoy being on panels where folks like you have come together to think about the next generation, because if we can't inspire you to go out there and make change and be a change agent in your world and think about not just the machines but about creativity, then we've lost. So the opportunity to win is greater than ever before, and it stems specifically on what are we gonna do to innovate and make different that what we have relied on as the status quo or the system that preceded us. Let, let me add from a perspective of, of a corporation, of the, the large complex organizations that uh, run many of the aspects of our life, we also see an, an evolution of things because sometimes it's good to have just a little of historical perspective. No? The schools, the way that we know, the universities, the way that we know today, the workspace, the workplace, the way that we know, is just one century, century and a half old. Before that, we were basically on a much more rural society. Uh, we were in the world of guilds and crafts that were the ones that were training the people. So I think that things evolve and the, what we are seeing is a, is a tipping point where clearly the way that we produce individuals <laughs> is uh, mechanical, is manufacturing, and the system is changing. There are more and more recognition that there are more things that input and output. And also, the demands in the workplace, the demands in the marketplace are different because the technology is allowing us for a level of personalization than the mass production before was not able to do. So you can order things now that are at a reasonable price, perfectly done for you as an individual. In order to get that from the machine of the marketplace, you need to have different characters driving that. Okay? And the, these different characters need to be trained, thought, in a different way. So I think that this is an evolution, and there are spaces that are a little way ahead. There are spaces that are much more backwards. And, but the society is moving, and the technology is this lubricant that is accelerating, is getting things in your hand, the power in your hand, to change how things were before. I think one of the things that's so exciting about what you're saying is um, you know, thinking about the, the dialectic at, the, at this event, right? We've got universities and career educators who are on the cutting edge, and then we also have corporations and entrepreneurial ventures trying to push into that innovation world. And I think what we have with the four of us are, are people who are pushing out from the, the enterprise and from businesses and thinking about the things that we think, that we know we need in the workforce and then starting to have those conversations with universities and, and long-time educators so that we can create that dialogue and start to inform each other and ultimately co-create even more advanced ecosystems of education. Let me ask, I mean, Guillermo, I wanted to pick up on this. Um, so we have, some, we have some bright lights in this, but to what extent does an IBM feel like they ultimately have to do remedial training for your employees, bring those coming in up to baseline, the kinds of original problem solving, creativity that might be required in that versus you're having very organizational specific needs that you tailor your organization learning objectives to that might include creativity. Help me appreciate how much you're working from a deficit versus just building on. Well, first, I don't think it's about remedial. I think that each individual comes with a set of, of characteristics. To, to something, and we hire the people because of that, and then you have to get up to a speed. It's more of the paradigms of what you learn for. So, if you play Mario Bros, how many of you play Mario Bros? <laughs> Mario Bros, Mario Bros fanatics? Okay, Mario Bros needs to learn many things. First, needs to learn how to jump the bridge, just to not miss it. If not, he goes into the hole. Huh? So, Mario Bros needs to jump. Then he needs to learn how to escape the cocodrives. Then he needs to learn how to get into the castle. And finally, he needs to learn how to rescue the princess. Okay. Now, in life, 
you have something to learn for today. You need to know how to do your job. You need to learn how to jump into the next opportunity. Jump out of the cocodriles. Sometimes we call it managers. In, in that game, it's cocodriles. <laughs> it's how to jump out of that. <laughs> then you have to see what is the next shift in your career. And then you have to create a habit of lifelong learning. So it's more about that, how we help the people. Because in some cases, you need to have much more stronger creativity because you are playing a role in a team that requires some domain expertise, the specific domain expertise. And then you chief, and you have a different role. And then you need to know exactly what is the technology that will make the difference. And we don't want too much of a design thinking. We now you to know exactly how the cloud connects to the hybrid and how all these things make the experience amazing on the other side of the spectrum. So I would say that maybe in, the, in terms of education and learning, it's more about having the correct doses of preparation for your day to day, for three months down the road, for two years, for five years, for a lifelong learning paradigm. Okay. I, I got to jump on the backside of that just because I, I think you've just highlighted something that is, is, is a reminder. And in case we've lost it for a second, if our parents had one job, we will have five. The next generation will have five at the same time. So when you think about what kind of education system is acquired, not to disparage any particular part of it, you know, whether it's K-12, higher, whatever, but it's required to learn multiple skills. You have mo lifetimes worth of career or careers in decades now. And so you have to have a system that can adopt. And whether you want to um, you know, learn from any of the platforms that us on stage have built or something that doesn't yet exist. You've heard that stat. You know, I have a, uh, um, a nephew who's like, hey, they said the job I'm going to have doesn't even exist yet. What does that mean, Uncle Chase? And how are we preparing? It's not just the actual thing. We're training people to do a thing. That's a skill that's, that's amazing. But what Guillermo was talking about is we have to learn how to learn. To us, the, the meta layer that our culture has is absent right now is the desire, the understanding, the realization that learning how to learn is perhaps the biggest lever that we can have as a culture. I think building on that, one of the things that we're seeing is a rich trend out there in the workforce is that people inside of companies have this passion to teach each other. So as we're moving around and we're career shifting multiple times in our lives and whatever you came in knowing isn't necessarily all you're expected to do and work on in your time at that particular company, let alone wherever you end up next. We're starting to see this come up in lots of different organizations all across the globe where they're creating learning ecosystems inside that are extraordinarily informal and really playful. So it might be everything from teaching each other how to make paella and knit to teaching coding techniques and, and drawing and photography or how to use the most current piece of software. And so that was one of the really powerful early inspirations for IDOU was that we inside of IDEO knew that tech was changing so fast, none of us could keep up. And yet we also had all of these passions mm -hmm. outside that we wanted to keep in balance with how hard everybody was working. And so we literally had this wall inside of our entryway where we had little cards up, you know, give and get. This is something I can teach. This is something I want to learn. And so this sort of learning ecosystem started inside, started to scale across the globe, and then we thought about, well, if we start to take something like this online, we can teach not just the official stuff that we've been teaching for the last three decades, but start to add into this ecosystem and make it one of the blurriest parts of our, our brand and our boundary, and really create a global community of change makers who are passionate about these ways of working and doing. And so that is something that I think is is being amplified in the world because of the globalization of the workforce, because of the fast pace of change, and because of the passion people have to stay connected with each other in really different ways in the modern world. And all yeah. of that is just so exciting. It's so interesting. So I, my background's in corporate America for the most part, and then I became an entrepreneur and now work for an entrepreneur and in an entrepreneurial environment. And I think one of, one of the things that I am so inspired by in the workforce and in the culture that we've created um, is the ability that a, a person isn't just the function that they're in, right? So in our organization, we have filmmakers who are learning analytics via the insights that our marketing team's able to derive from a class trailer. 
Um, and all of a sudden, an editor is really interested in learning about analytics and spending time actually understanding that better and how it can make him better at what he does. Similarly, um, we do uh, inter an internal like learning program where we have engineers teaching photography because it's something that they're really passionate about. Um, and it, it helps to bridge those gaps and um, enables the entire team to really um, learn and pursue passions in a really, really special way. Let me ask you, I mean, let me ask you a question here on, is this where you're describing, I'm hearing one theme being that life kind of um, historically maybe has drawn out this, this industrial revolution, the work environment, needing to restore the ability to integrate whole person into work life. Um, how much of this is either universities getting, getting more narrowly focused perhaps, employers needing to shift? Um, are any of you seeing models where even, although you may say I'm going directly to individuals, but have you have any stories where groups have gotten together in, in similar organizations and have found a master class of Creative Live? Yeah. Or ways in which you've seen connectivity occurring in surprising ways? And then ultimately, Guillermo, would organizations like an IBM look to a master class or a Creative Live, or is that too unstructured or unfocused? Mm -hmm. And so maybe you could kind of share your thoughts on that I, I Can we go to Guillermo's question first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, starting with. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that the, the first answer is probably we need to change the title of the panel to say robots to the rescue. <laughs> because it's precisely the ability of technology that gives you this scale up capacity to have time, focus, and a structure to do these things, to scale up. So let me give you three examples, OK? Uh, Georgia Tech. In Georgia Tech, when you take a class, you have an assistant professor that helps you. Okay? And two semesters ago, there was one assistant professor that was the top rated assistant professor of all. It was Stella Watson. And Stella Watson was not a professor, it was a computer okay? that did the job of being an assistant professor, answering emails, having chats with the students to accelerate their success in the in their class, and it was done with artificial intelligence. It was Watson. Another example is now in our busy lives, uh, we have to buy things quickly, and we don't have time to spend three hours in a supermarket or even in Costco. So then you have Amazon to the rescue, and in Amazon Prime, you can do click, and you get in your door almost anything, including fresh veg vegetables, okay? Because they have the Amazon marketplace, and this is not advertising, but they structure the providers in different layers, so they make things, these, these things happen as quote unquote magic. No? So, and then you have communities for coaching, and the matching is not something that you can do manually to a schedule. Imagine a, a master scheduler. In, in IBM, we have a, an app that is, is called Coach, Coach Me. Okay? And Coach Me, has usually runs between 10,000 and 12,000 coaching sessions a month, okay? So if I have to put people to a schedule and to do matchings for those sessions, I will go crazy, uh, or I cannot afford to do it in, an, in a corporation. So we put artificial intelligence to the rescue, and we profile the people, and then we do the matches, and we learn from the matches that didn't go right, like a dating website. You know? one of these web dating websites, but we do it for coaching. So it's more on the, the technology to the rescue, actually, to rescue these spaces of creativity in a society that is getting busier and busier. Yeah, we think a lot about the digital assist for, so that the human system can do its work even better. So um, we've done a lot of work inside of companies to help scale up the teaching of something so that then they when we create affordances with the companies that we're working with, we've done this with some organizations in the US government or the Dubai government, where they'll take our courses and then do some sort of education in person. So they can scale something or on live uh, forums where they're discussing the issues that are particular and relevant and specific to their own industry and their own vertical and their own specific issues. Um, in full disclosure, I've collaborated with this guy over here, Gordon, and his program at uh, Boise State, so the School of Design and Innovation, where we've worked with universities where people can use our courses as 
the best, most live and interactive textbook you can ever imagine, but it's up to the professors to actually teach in the classroom and do real project work alongside the students, and that's where the learning gets really deep. So the digital assist is amazing for scale, amazing to learn, amazing for the data, so that you can continue to make things even better, but it's that true partnership between the human side and the digital that it makes the music. Chase, do you have any stories? Tell me some stories from Creative Live in terms of how that might, the use cases that you might see, any examples where either folks, it sounds like you've, you're, you're committed to that individual learner re, uh, rejuvenating, continuing to grow as in a creative class. I'm assuming that you and master class maybe fall a little more on the side of le learn, to, uh, learn to enrich and ultimately apply wherever you may see that necessary. Perhaps the other two panelists at the end here are a little more applied in sort of the partnerships. You can bring home the learnings that you're getting from those sure. side. What, what are you seeing? Well, I think there's the formal, then there's the informal. And I'm, I'm gonna try and make a, a point that, uh, as clear as possible, which is I think there's a tendency to think about that, that this is a nice to have. But the best companies in the world, the leadership companies in the world, they put design first. Everything in this room that you're touching, seeing, it was all designed by someone before it was ever built. Building is solving a problem of bringing something that you've already conceived of, that you've drawn, that you've written out the formula for on a piece of paper or in a computer program. And so that's the level at which we're talking. It, there's a tendency to frame creativity or what we do um, in inspiration with this like, oh yeah, and as an also, which it, it literally, you know, I, I think Guillermo's point was great, but it's actually creativity rescuing the machines, because without the machines, the, the machines have nothing to build. Literally, they have nothing to build. And just to put it in, in maybe a little bit more concrete um, terms, when I say creativity is the new literacy, I think it's pretty easy to just say that's a catchy phrase, but uh, you know, this, if, if this device, whatever brand you have, uh, in your pocket. If this is the Swiss Army knife, in 2007, 8, 9, the camera was the toothpick, right? It was a nice to have, it was on the side. The camera today and forevermore is the future. It is the epicenter, it is the blade, it is AR, it is VR, it is photography, it is video, it is bitmojis, it is everything that you get. Words relegated to second place, third place. A formula is something that a computer does like that. And it's one robot hand is teaching the other robot hand how to work. It's writing code in real time. Communicating hint, like human ingenuity and the ability to connect things, especially unlike items, to come together to form something new, that happens with the camera at the center of the ecosystem. So if you ever think that what I'm talking about or what we're talking about here is second tier, that's part of my mission and the mission of Creative Live is to help people understand that this is not some second rate requirement. This is absolutely core to the future, not of uh, machines or, but literally our planet. And along the way, you get to take some pretty pictures, design some stuff, take a tennis lesson from Serena. There's some benefits, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it's life with benefits. Well, let me ask you this question then. I mean, we all love the trend in our, at our back. What, what trends do you believe are at your back versus headwinds to your various organizations' um, success, continued adoption? I mean, we, we, I'm sure, are an audience that appreciates this side of creativity, but who else isn't in this room that might represent either headwinds or more people that are at your back? Talk about the prospects for the future. I can think of two things that come up for me. I think one that's um, so part of this entire conference is one of the um, wins at our back is definitely the power and the general acceptance of design thinking. I think the fact that the world and the education landscape is starting to adopt that, that teachers and professors are teaching it, that, that organizations as vast as IBM um, and Infosys are, are picking up on design thinking and making it so core to the ways that they're working. That is amazingly powerful for the world of creativity and the world of design. I think what we're facing next is what else is needed in that ecosystem. I love what you're talking about with agility, with remaining nimble, all those kinds of things. But I think one of the things we need to wrestle is what are the more advanced techniques for creative leadership? What does it mean for a CEO to be a truly creative leader and set the conditions 
for people inside of an organization to have a culture that supports that at large. You know, I think there are things with, um, with lean startup methodology, where everything pivots and you're constantly changing, but when you're working with an organization the scale of like a Ford or an IBM, it's hard to pivot. And so how do you hold the space for people to be more creative and approach problems with the reality of the fact that we do not know what the questions are yet, and we certainly don't know what the answers are. I think the other, the other trend that's working for all of us up here is that we're getting education coming from the corporation now. And so because we need so much more in the modern workforce, I think the fact that you're going to see so many more brands teaching the things that they think are important in the world and not doing that as the antithesis of the university but, and, and post-secondary learning, but hopefully in partnership so that it makes it easier on some of these institutions that are, are struggling to get the funding to create all of the different varieties of education we need in the US, certainly to stay competitive and certainly around the globe, just to handle the needs of, of the modern workforce, I think is one of the things that's gonna be really exciting to, to watch in the near decade. Well, I think that there is something even more fundamental that is, is changing and is a, a very powerful trend. Any boy or girl that was born in the last two, three years will live for 100 years. So demographics is changing the way that we think on the traditional setup of our lives. If we were organized to study, work, and retire, that paradigm is gone. My kids are going to hopefully live 90, 100 years. So imagine how boring can be to be a lawyer for 90 years. <laughs> no? I am a lawyer for this <laughs> But uh, these paradigms on, on the, the society is prepared to, you are prepared to study, then you are prepared to work, and then you are prepared to play golf in Florida, if you are lucky in the previous stages. That is gone. That, you cannot sustain that from an economic point of view and from a human being curiosity point of view in a 100-year life. In a 100-year life, the paradigm, so when do you study? When do you work? When do you semi-retire? When do you come back in a second career, in a second specialization? When do you retire again for a little time or, or take a gap year? So all these paradigms, with, the, with demographics and with the advance of, of the science, of course, are going to change. So the institutions will need to change. Now is an afterthought to have the universities created this executive education arm. Uh, well, actually, they will need to organize themselves because there is gonna be a whole, a whole generation of uh, millennials that in 20 years will come back to get a second career or maybe will not come back there, will go to a boot camp or will be trained by the corporations or something else that doesn't exist today. But demographics is really changing this paradigm. It's changing and will change dramatically, I would say. What turns do you all say? Go for it. So I think we've, we've obviously seen a lot of success in leveraging video. Um, in, our, in our case, um, you know, Aaron Sorkin is an example, going to university and speaking in front of a lecture hall of students could maybe touch 400 people and you know, leveraging video and through our platform, he's literally able to touch um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions over time. Um, I think the things that we're really interested in um, and are leaning into a little bit are about augmented reality and virtual reality and how those can help augment the learning experience. Um, so it's something that we're definitely like leaning into and, and trying to um, you know, think about um, in a small way to start um, in the kind of walk before you run in, in small ways, figuring out how to integrate a specific feature into a class that might help further the learning experience. Um, and then, you know, eventually long term in five to 10 years, what that might look like from, a, from an entire course perspective um, is something that we're really interested in. Yeah. Um, I think the things that are at our back are obvious. The, like creativity, the value of creativity, even the word creator, it's proliferation. You can look at it in the lexicon, it's just skyrocketing. Um, the most valuable companies in the world are design first companies. Um, and these examples, they, they make it easier uh, for us. But 
we're not even close to where we need to be. Some of the headwinds, um, I think, let's see, <laughs> it could be a very long answer, but <laughs> ultimately some of the headwinds are the fact that right now, for example, we still have a, um, there's a cultural narrative that says if you go to work, or so if you go to school, get good grades, you're going to get a good job. If you get a good job, you're going to have a happy life. In 40 years, you're going to get the gold watch. And whether we think it here, you know, in this, this world that we're in here, which is still a little bit of a bubble, uh, let me say a lot of a bubble, um, we, don't, we don't talk about that in, our, in, in this room all that much. But the reality is that is still the dominant narrative. So until we change that narrative, we've got our work cut out for us. And the reality is that um, if you look at the jobs that don't yet exist that are around the corner, and if you look at the fact that so many of the major um, traditional formats of education are declining, these are, are largely um, ivy towers covered, yeah, stone towers covered with ivy. There, there's, there's a lot of challenges that they are um, going through right now. But the reality is that the future of uh, a mark or an evaluation it looks much more like a portfolio than a resume. And it's what you've built, who you've built it with, who you learned with, what have you actually done. Now, the, there's a, a, I get a lot of pushback on this because a certificate and all that stuff, it's valuable. And there's data that says it's valuable. But the reality is, and if, you, if any of you out there are, are sports fans or you know anything about Wayne Gretzky, he's got a famous quote of, I want to skate to where the puck's going to be not to where it is now. And if, we, if, if you can realize that the, the portfolio is how creative lives have been judged for the past thousands of years, and this idea of a resume, the idea of where you went to school, I think the data says something like, if you went to the top 13 schools in the country, that you're, you're X, likely, X more likely to get the job. And if you go, the second tier is like 1,000 or 1,400 schools wide then you're sort of all piled together. So if you start to look at those as paradigm shifts, do you want to try and track in that top 13 schools in the country, or can you start thinking on a different, you know, again, we're talking about headwinds here, and this is, it might be, you know, melting some of your minds right now, but that, that's really where the future of employment is going. What have you made? What can you point at? Who did you learn with? Under what circumstances? And those things are historically soft. But that's the part that we have to get used to as a culture because scoring everything with data, especially around things, the ability to put unlikely things together into something new and better and different, that's going to take us a while to figure out how to score that. I think what you're saying about the, the portfolio of work, I think, is one of the headwinds I definitely see is in parts of the, the nation and the globe where those opportunities don't exist to even yeah. make that portfolio. And so we have so many situations where whenever you've got the pressures of, of no jobs or companies closing, everybody clinches up. It's the same thing when you've got revenue down for a quarter and everybody clinches up and it's hard to build an argument for that different narrative about making space for creativity. And so I think that's one of the things we all still need to work on is connecting that through and having those examples that we can show about success in parts of the country or parts of the marketplace where Creativity is not necessarily always accepted or assumed and where they are in places of, of great clinching up because they're so nervous about what's coming next in the future and times are so uncertain. So and it is the hardest what, time. Yeah, that, and that's where the robots come in, honestly. Like, um, you know, this is great. There's, you know, a room full of people. But, you know, our first class at Creative Live ever had 50,000 people. Our second class had 100,000. Our third class ever, three months into being a company, had 150,000 people. A year and a half later, the concept of the AI class at Stanford with 131,000 people came out as the biggest class ever. And I'm sitting here going like, I had 150,000 people in a photography <laughs> class last year. So all of that can only happen with the robots. And to me, that's, you know, when, when we think about working, um, you know, some of the, the top 100 brands in the company, uh, in, in, the, in the world rather, have reached out to us about how to, you know, bring the, the everyone I think the robot stuff is very, um, it's easy, it's tactile, it's easy to understand, and this other stuff is harder. So as you talk about Henwoods, yes, the, these two things are coming together, but we need the robots. We really need the robots, so don't go, don't go far, Guillermo. <laughs> don't worry, we have a steady pipeline. <laughs> 
<laughs> Great. Well, here's, here's, here's what we'll do, because we're going to need to draw this to a close. I think certainly uh, the title was really the jumping off point. I really appreciate this panel. The question I would have asked if we'd had more time as the closing question would have been one thing that each of you are most excited about your specific endeavor. Um, I don't have time because we're down to 10 seconds, so I'm going to ask anybody interested in the audience, if you're interested in those answers of any individual, please come on up if you join me now in thanking the panel. Really appreciate it.